Hello. Welcome. Don't do that. No. Great pleasure of being the department chair that I am able to preside over the annual Heritage Colloquium. And uh, I'd like to say a few words. Many of us remember, uh, of us remember Uncle Paul as I call him uh, very well. He was uh, spent a great deal of time at the University of Florida. Of course, he's a legendary figure of that time. The most prolific author, more than 1,500 articles. And, uh, you know, he has his own autobiography, he has a film around him, which uh, everyone can probably really enjoy. He was here, I think, from 1973 all the way from 1996. Every spring, he would have a two week stay. He worked closely with many of our colleagues. So Krishna, Alani, Dean Larson, and many others. The Yerich Colloquium was instituted in 1998 by Krishna. It's continued uh, in a straight line since then. The first speaker was uh, Ron Graham. George Andrews has been one of the speakers. And on the list is too long to go through all the names. So it's, a, it's a very distinguished group. Um, so I think. Uh, So to introduce the speaker, we will have one of the sponsors of this, this conference, which is uh, David Norton, the Vice President for Research, who's uh, graciously contributed our funding. So Dr. Norton. So first of all, for those of you who are not from Gainesville, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you here at the University of Florida for this outstanding event. I'm glad that we could bring you nice warm weather if you happen to be from somewhere further north where it's not quite as pleasant. Um, but welcome here. This is really this is really a highlight for to be a Friday afternoon, the last thing I do walking out the door, other than I have a briefcase full of things to work on this weekend is to be at a, cop, at a workshop like this where people are actually talking about the science, looking at hard problems and doing some what is really for someone in the science a lot of fun. And so this is a pleasure for me to be a part of it. And I thank the organizers for offering me this opportunity. Um, very pleased to be a sponsor of this event and very pleased to see such fantastic participation uh, in this. So thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, who is Professor Hugh Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is one of the most eminent mathematicians uh, on the planet. <laughs> not a bad, that's not a bad thing here. I'm not quite sure how you measure that, but I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> specializes in analytic number theory, where he has established several fundamental results on the Riemann zeta function, prime numbers, and the large season. His revolutionary PhD thesis at Cambridge University on multiplicative number theory written under the direction of Harold Davenport earned him the prestigious Adams Prize in 1972 for a seminal work in, on the large C. He was awarded the Salem Prize in 1974. Through his own work, his collaborations most notably with Robert Vaughn, and through his mentoring of students and postdocs, he is one of the most influential mathematicians of our time. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Montgomery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. In the spring of 1974, the phone rang at 7 a.m. and uh, it was an operator delivering me a telegram, informing me that I had won, was being awarded the Salem Prize. I had always thought of this as a prize in harmonic analysis, and I thought there must be some mistake, so I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there was this uh, colloquium about the Hilbert problems, in, and uh, I went to that, and Bateman was there. He'd just come from Paris, and uh, Zygmunt had 
assigned him the job of making sure that I'd gotten the word. So at that point, then I had except they'd really done it, you know. <laughs> It was a big surprise. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, learn that I'm so eminent. I didn't know that. Uh, um, before I get underway talking about uh, the subject at hand, I'd like to say a few words about Erdish. I first met him in January of 1966, when it was the beginning of my last semester as an undergraduate. And uh, he was in Urbana for that semester. Uh, he had an apartment in the Atlanta Union next door to Old Gail Hall. It was very convenient. And uh, during that term, he uh, ran a problem solving seminar with John Selfridge. And I was a student taking that course. Uh, I don't remember too much about the problems that were posed. Now, I may have notes someplace. There was one problem that was quite easy and probably familiar to most of you, that if you have n integers uh, between, well, if you have a collection of integers between 1 and 2n, and no one of them divides another, then the number of integers in the set is at most n. Uh, it's pretty easy, but that's sort of a warm-up. He asked a harder problem. If you have n integers between n and 1 and 2n, and no one divides another, then how small can the least member of the set be? Uh, that's harder. I mean, it, uh, it took me a couple weeks. I worked pretty hard on that. I did solve it during the term, but uh, it wasn't you know, immediate. And uh, if you haven't seen that problem before, I, I sort of recommend it to you. It's, it it's, uh, has sort of a charming answer. Uh, during that term, Erdős and Selfridge were working on this diacon or family of diacontine equations uh, for various values of r and k, um, product of r integers, consecutive integers equal to a kth power. And they were proving in one each case after another that there are no solutions. And finally, they wrote a paper, uh, a product of consecutive positive integers cannot be, is, is never a kth power. Uh, I don't remember, I don't think. I don't think they finished the paper during that term, but they were making progress on it at that time. Um, oh, Erdish invited me to visit him in his apartment to have tea. And this was sort of terrifying for me because I knew his mother would be there, and that meant I had to meet his mother. And I went there shaking as a leaf, you know, and then very nervous. <laughs> um, I saw him then many times later, in the years subsequently, one time that stands out, it was just one year later, um, he, I was a graduate student in Cambridge then, and uh, he happened to be in Cambridge at the time of the Six Day War, which was a pretty terrifying event. Uh, no internet, no cell phones, you know, it was hard to get word of what was going on. Anyway, uh, I could tell you more stories about Eric, but <laughs> then I never got any mathematics. We're glad to hear. So let's talk about a little bit of polynomials. A little bit of polynomial is a trigonometric polynomial uh, with coefficients plus or minus one and uh, on an interval. Uh, and the, as you'll see, the, the location of the interval is not important. What's important is the length of the interval. It could be one to n or, or zero to n minus one. I've written it zero to n. This is not quite, this is Littlewood's notation, f sub n, but the definition is not quite Littlewood's. Littlewood's Definition: He went. His sums went from zero to n, and that meant that there were n plus one terms, and that means that the formulas all look complicated. I mean, it's just easier if you have n terms and, and not worry about it. But then the f sub n are. Uh, uh, oh, of course, I'm using the complex exponential notation of Vinogradov. Um, the f sub n are a subclass of a much larger class that is trigonometric polynomials with unimodular complex coefficients. And then one asks questions about uh, the sizes of these things. So if you have such a trigonometric polynomial, you square it out and integrate term by term, and you get parcels identity. Uh, and since the coefficients in either class have absolute value 1, uh, the right-hand side there is n. So we know the mean square of uh, g. And uh, then the question is, well, then we know that the minimum of mod g is 
less than or equal to the root mean square, and the max is greater than or equal to the root mean square. So square root of n uh, defines a sort of scale or, or order of magnitude. It's, a, it's our unit. We're, we're measuring things relative to square root of n. Uh, and one of the things we do also is we, um, since mod g squared has mean value of n, we can subtract the mean from that and square to find a variance in squaring out. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> 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 I hope that wasn't fun. <laughs> uh, so this is a, the, a formula for the variance. There are two formulas for the variance. Uh, they're, of course, familiar. And one of the questions we're interested in is, can the, the fourth moment be only a little bit larger than the square of the second moment? Or, you know, or how much larger does it have to be? Clearly, it has to be larger. So we have these two formulas, and we have questions. Now, what I want to say before we continue is, if I multiply a, 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 a trigonometric polynomial by e of kx, that translates all the coefficients to another interval. But it, the e of kx is unimodular, so that doesn't change the absolute value of the trigonometric polynomial. So it doesn't matter what interval we're on, and the only thing that's significant is the length of the interval. Uh, and so now we have all kinds of questions which would start for all n or all sufficiently large n or for infinitely many n. Does there exist a function in f or g uh, with sub n uh, with, well, possibly the minimum as large as root n? Uh, clearly the minimum could be zero. I mean, trigonometric polynomials do have zeros on them. But we're interested in the opposite case, so, so that when the minimum modulus is actually of the order of magnitude of the square root of n, uh, or the maximum modulus of the square root of n. Uh, we have, we know trigonometric polynomials, um, Littlewood polynomial, well, Littlewood polynomial can be as large as n. But that, and, you know, we study peak functions too, but this is the opposite of a peak function. This is a function that it doesn't have, well, it'll have peaks, but they're very mild. They're all of the order of root n. Um, and then we ask, are there trigonometric polynomials um, with both these properties, where the, um, the absolute value lives in an annulus with inner and outer radii comparable to the square root of n? Uh, and finally, we ask, uh, can this fourth moment be less than 1 plus epsilon times the square of the second moment, or is there a concept bigger than one that, that separates the, the, the two? The, the fourth moment has to be larger than c times n squared. So we have questions of this kind that we ask both about the families f and g. Now, I, I want to record sort of the history of this subject. And actually, it's sort of a good time to do that because this is now the centenary of the beginning of this subject. Exactly 100 years ago, Hardy and Littlewood um, wrote a paper um, and uh, introducing the first example of a function of a trigonometric polynomial with no big peaks. Uh, it's interesting that they said it to the proceedings of the National Academy, not to Comte Rambeau, but then this was during the First World War and maybe it was easier to send a manuscript to Washington than to Paris. So I don't know the details, but uh, on the surface of it, they would send announcements to Comte Rambeau normally. Uh, and so they defined this trigonometric polynomial and observed that it's uniformly big O of square root of n. And this was the first known example of a trigonometric polynomial of the class two that, that this could be achieved. And this has applications in um, Fourier analysis. Um, for example, um, now let me give you, well, recall the definition of a of Lipschitz class of lambda sub alpha. And, um, the alpha here is between 0 and 1. The classes become larger as alpha becomes larger. So the functions become more and more jagged. They're, they're not required to be as continuous. This is a sort of quantitative measure of continuity. Uh, given epsilon, how big does delta, you know, how, how, big, how small does delta have to be? That's the, the issue. Um, and so, for example, the square root of x function is a good one half. Um, and then the question is, how smooth does the function have to be in order that its Fourier series will necessarily be absolutely convergent? And Bernstein proved a theorem on this subject 
uh, namely that if f is in lift alpha with alpha bigger than a half, then it is uh, the Fourier series is absolutely convergent. But then the question is, could you could you sharp, could you improve on Bernstein's theorem? Maybe lift alpha, maybe alpha bigger than zero is enough, or, or maybe alpha equals one half would be enough. But the answer is, uh, uh, lift one half does not suffice, and you can now construct an example using the hardy littlewood coefficient. And it's easy to prove that this is in lift one half. You, you, uh, it's just a, a, a summation by parts. You, you, you take the the coefficient times the exponential, and you sum that, and you difference the one over n, and uh, you, you know you have the initial terms and the later terms, and, and so on. But uh, uh, it's a short argument. And so having these coefficients uh, enables you to construct examples of things that can happen in in Fourier analysis. Now, also at about the same time, uh, a second example emerged with complex unimodular coefficients. And this concerned a vial sum. A vial sum is nothing more than an exponential sum in which the argument is a polynomial with real coefficients, uh, polynomial with real coefficients. And of course, Vial's famous theorem of that era was that if at least one of the coefficients, not, not including the constant term, but C1 through CD, uh, if one of those, at least one of those, is irrational, then the, the values, using, using a non-trivial estimate of the vial sum, and uh, then vial's criterion for uniform distribution, it follows that the sequence of numbers, P of n, is uniformly distributed modulo 1. Uh, and in the course, Hardy Littlewood was estimating vial sums. This was before they had introduced the circle method, and it, uh, they already first worked with Ramanujan on the partition function, and that was sort of a precursor of the circle method. And they had worked on sums of squares, but they, it was really in the, into the 1920s when they got, uh, where they used their ability to estimate vial sums that they started to get into the circle method. Uh, but in the course of working on vial sums, uh, this example, Emerged, and I don't know who first discovered this or recorded it, it, it by now it's classical. Uh, it'd be interesting to know, but maybe not the most important thing. The, the shape of that sum, it makes, it makes you think of, of a Gauss sum, because you've got n squared in the denominator. Um, it, and we can write Gauss sums in terms of the Lagrange symbol, where with a uh, for any fraction a over p, we have a, a good bound on, on, on the sum. And so that raises the question, um, might this sum be big O over p for all, you know, if you could define a trigonometric polynomial, replace the a over p by x with this trigonometric sum. Now this is a little bit sum because it's uh, coefficients are plus or minus one. And um, could this be, um, big O squared of x. Well, there's something called the Nyquist sampling rate. And we haven't sampled this often enough to deduce that this is big O squared of p. And in fact, it's omega of root p, log log p, for every prime, not just some primes. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, it's down below by that, um, for every prime. OK, the second big event in the history of little bit polynomials is, uh, or the, this general area of unimodular polynomials, was the discovery by Harold Shapiro uh, in his master's thesis of 1951 at MIT, uh, so that's 65 years ago. I'll tell you a little story. Um, Alan Shields uh, was my colleague in, until he died, and, and he was a, a young budding mathematician growing up in Manhattan. Uh, at the same time, Harold Shapiro was. But there was another Harold Shapiro at the same time. That was H. N. Shapiro, who was at uh, Courant at, at NYU. Uh, well, H. S. Shapiro and H. N. Shapiro. H. N. Shapiro was known as Harold the Noisy, and H. N. Shapiro was known as Harold the Silent. <laughs> <laughs> but it was apt, I think. But the sign of Harold Shapiro is very, very loud. He's an astrophysicist, a Max Stegman. Of which Harold Shapiro? Yeah, S, Harold S. Yeah, the son of Harold S. 
The son of Harold S. is. Okay, so Harold, the, uh, our Harold, defined uh, a family of trigonometric polynomials starting with, uh, it's a pair, they come in pairs, um, P and Q, uh, and each one is defined uh, recursively in terms of the previous pair. Um, and uh, the, the ex uh, shoot. Point. Uh, this exponential shifts the frequencies of this one just past these, so that when you add these, uh, you have two to the k uh, coefficients here and two to the k coefficients there, and they make together uh, two to the k plus one uh, consecutive coefficients, zero up to two to the k plus one minus one. And similarly for or Q. And then uh, the thing is, we use this familiar identity from uh, complex variables, which is easily proved because if you expand the z plus w mod squared and then the z minus w mod squared and sum, the cross product terms drop out, so you get the stated identity. Well, uh, the uh, expression that Harold has is uh, ideally suited for that. And uh, so uh, the result is that the mod square of pk plus the mod square of 2k is twice um, p minus k minus 1 mod squared and twice plus twice qk minus 1 mod squared. And you can induct on that, and then you finally get 2 to the k plus 1 at the end. Um, now, if you just look at the piece k plus 1, this is non negative, so this quantity is bounded by 2 to the k plus 1, so on taking square roots, p sub k is uniformly bounded by square root 2 times 2 to the k over 2, but, but 2 to the k is your n, so this is square root of 2 times square root of n. So this now achieves for um, a little bit polynomial what Harding Littlewood had achieved, uh, you know, however long, uh, you know, 40 years, 35 years earlier with uh, unimodular complex coefficients. Oh, yeah, there's this one identity that, that we used here. Um, I want to mention that uh, that has a name. It's called the law of the par parallelogram. If you use W and Z to generate a parallelogram, uh, well, the sides of that parallelogram have lengths and also the diagonals. And what we've shown with that simple uh, algebraic calculation using complex numbers is the law of the parallel parallelogram, which says, says that the sums of the squares of the lengths of the two diagonals of a parallelogram is equal to the sums of the squares of the lengths of the four sides of the parallelogram, uh, which you can prove using Pythagorean uh, Stuff. Although, you know, you still have some cases and so on. I, uh, I pester my undergraduates with proofs of, in, of theorems in uh, classical plane Euclidean geometry uh, using complex numbers. Uh, for example, Napoleon's theorem, which states that if you start with an arbitrary triangle and you construct on the sides an equilateral triangle, and then you construct also the centers of those uh, equilateral triangles, and you sort of forget everything else except those centers. Uh, they form the vertices of the triangle, of course, and Napoleon's theorem says that triangle is going to be equilateral. And I wouldn't want to prove this <coughs> using Euclid's <coughs> techniques, but uh, using complex numbers, it's a simple calculation. It's no ingenuity, it's just, it just goes. You know. anyway, to get back to the subject at hand, uh, after uh, Shapiro's work, uh, the, he didn't publish the, that in a journal, but it sort of spread through the, uh, by word of mouth, and uh, Erich and Littlewood both were uh, interested in this, and, and that's really when, Little, that's where Littlewood's interest in what we now call Littlewood polynomials uh, started. Erich published a paper on some unsolved problems in the Michigan Mathematical Journal in 1957. This is a very often 
quoted paper that's remembered is for the questions he raised about little bit polynomials, and, and for uh, and it also this isn't little bit polynomials, the other the wider class use of it. Is it true that the maximum must be larger than a constant times squared event where the constant is uh, absolute constant bigger than one? Uh, we now know, and I'll, I'll uh, describe that, we now know that the answer is no. But and, and actually, it's unfair. Some people refer to this and say, disproving a conjecture of variance. Well, I don't see a conjecture here. It erases the question. Uh, and uh, then he continues. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting him verbatim. The notation is sort of for this talk, but, but uh, I'm quoting his words here. He has an unpublished proof. Uh, of this result lower bound for the real part. Now, um, I, he might have published that later, but at, at the time he wrote this, he, he made this remark. Uh, and then he, in problem 26, there were a total of 28 problems in the paper. Uh, does there exist for each n, uh, f in the Littlewood class, the f, uh, f class f sub n, such that the absolute value is uniformly of the order of magnitude of the root and square for all x. And um, that and that question we still don't know the answer to. Uh, he says Pliny has some unpublished partial results on this. Um, and um, I, if you look, you find that Pliny did later publish those results. Uh, and also in 59, uh, Rudin rediscovered the Shapiro polynomials, so sometimes they're called the Rudin Shapiro polynomials. Um, uh, oh, I should add um, on the subject of this question that we still don't know the answer to, Andrew Odlisko has recently undertaken a massive com computation, pretty much exhaustive, of all little bit polynomials up to a certain degree, a certain length and looked at their statistical properties and so on. And he's found examples of little bit polynomials uh, that, uh, for which the values live between 1 half the square root of n and 3 halves the square root of n. So it, it still looks promising that there could be such. I mean, but, but he didn't find a, a sequence of them that seemed to form a pattern where you had something that you could try to, to prove. But uh, it looks still quite possible that such uh, <coughs> trigonometric polynomials uh, could exist. The, um, the Rudin Shapiro polynomials seem not to do that. They, uh, uh, well, um, they, ha they have the upper bound property, but they don't seem to stay away from zero. Uh, and then Littlewood was, uh, didn't write on this subject as quickly, but when he did write, uh, he wrote a number of papers, and if you look at the papers, they are very dense. I mean, they are packed with information. And uh, he obviously had put a lot of effort into this. And it was amusing when you read the papers, what you discover from them is he had harnessed Dick Lamer and a young Peter Swinnerton and Dyer to run computations for him. <laughs> um, and then he, he and Hardy had a unpublished list of problems just for their students, research problems. That, and so in, in the mid-1960s, somebody er, uh, persuaded him to publish the remnants of this list. Davenport was aghast. He, he was just, thought this was a colossally bad idea. It was never written up for public consumption. It was very rough and uneven and so on. Anyway. Um, uh, there are a number of familiar problems in, in uh, Littlewood's book. Uh, number two is gaps between sums of two squares, a problem I've worked on unsuccessfully. If you have a1 less than a2 less than and so on, the numbers that are sums of two squares, how big is the gap between them? Um, big O of x to one quarter is, uh, is trivial. You just use the greedy algorithm. Your first square is as big as possible, and then your next square is the less. You're trying to reach some number. You, you go as far as you can to the first one, and then you take the smallest square that gets you over the hump. Uh, and that hasn't been improved on. You think that all the exponential sums we know how to estimate, and all the, all the approximate functional equations with theta functions and so on, yeah, nothing. 
Uh, problem five, another familiar problem. Do, uh, is it true for every real number theta and phi that the limit, uh, this is now the distance to, uh, to the nearest integer notation, is that limit equal to zero? And that's a lot, of, if you say little bit's problem, just in the general public, this is what people think of this. Um, I've worked on that unsuccessfully. Um, problem 15 I was very interested in uh, back in like 1972 because I was able to show that, that um, if the answer to this question is yes, that if you have two functions, the capital F function it has the property that its Fourier coefficients majorize the Fourier coefficients of the first function, the, the little f. Does it follow that the p norm of little f is uh, bounded by the p norm of capital F when p is greater than equal to two? Well, if p happens to be an even integer. Uh, then, you know, like 2k, then you just raise f, little f and capital F to the k power and then apply parsable. And then you would have this with constant 1. So for even integers, yes, with constant 1. And Hardy and Littlewood knew that when, the, when p is 3, they gave an example showing that it wouldn't hold with constant 1. There are functions that require a constant bigger than 1. Uh, well, the answer is uh, when p is not an even integer bigger than 2, uh, uh, it's never true. It's only true when it's trivially true. And the point is, when p is not an even integer, uh, uh, we're talking about p greater than or equal to 2, but when it's not an even integer, uh, there's always an example that, that requires a constant bigger than 1. If f is such a function that requires, say, a trigonometric polynomial that requires a constant bigger than 1, um, keep track of time here, uh, then f of x times f of kx will require, if, if f requires a constant c, then this trigonometric polynomial, when capital K is large, will require a constant c squared. And so now you can, you know, if you can go c squared, then it's going to be c to the fourth. That's it. Uh, there's no constant with which that will work. Which is too bad for me, because uh, I could have proved the density hypothesis if, this had been, if the answer had been yes. But well, that occurs. If I told you that first, then you could infer that the answer is. Uh, okay, this is written up by the uh, Okay, so little bit dispenses with the first 18 problems in six pages. It's a third page per problem. And then he gets to problem 19, and he spends seven pages on that, and that's all about little bit formal notes. And he and he, but he did one thing that hadn't been done up to that point. He computed the fourth moment of the Shapiro polynomials and found the exact size and, and, and knew uh, how that related to the mean square. It's four-thirds of the mean square. So um, it's, of course, of the order of magnitude of n squared, but it's not 1 plus epsilon times n squared. Uh, and then he discussed them, but you know, he went on at great length. But he made very, uh, Erdős raised questions, but didn't state opinions about them. Erdős, a uh, little bit, um, actually made very specific conjectures. And also from the literature, um, you see mention of, in papers that were written in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, somebody would write, uh, uh, Erdős and Littlewood have partial results on this. And then you look in the bibliography for the, the word mentioned, it says oral communication. Okay, so, so it's clear that Erdős and Littlewood were in touch with each other and had, you know, were keeping track of Look, Erdős wrote papers on, tri on Fourier series and, and trigonometric polynomials. It's not what he's best known for, but he, he, this was one of his interests. Okay, conjecture one. There exist absolute constants little a and capital A. Well, this is the same as Erdős's uh, question. And little bit is conjecturing that the answer is yes, they do exist. Conjecture two. Uh, you, there exist uh, little bit polynomials whose uh, fourth moment is not more than one plus epsilon times the square of the second moment. Uh, so that's, uh, I think now probably most people think that this is not true, but just because people have been trying uh, for so long and not been making much progress in getting there, um, I guess, you know, we can get down to about 1.15 
but getting smaller is really tough. Um, and, but he makes it even stronger. He, he, he's making a conjecture about how, fa how fast the little of one does the serum. He's, he's saying that it's you know, really very close, uh, which uh, is really going up on the end of the limb. Now, his third conjecture, which will have to be on the next slide, uh, relates to conjecture one. So remember what conjecture one is. And now, uh, this is K in the Shapiro polynomial. Oh. The top one. The bottom one. The same last one. Last line. It's FK. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a misprint. That should be F. Yeah. Yeah. It should just be F. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so concerning conjecture one, he conjectures that the F that do that are very rare. Um, well, I would certainly think that their number is small o to the n. In fact, um, well, yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, little o to the n is not surprising, but big O of, of n cubed, that, that's saying, uh, and that should be a capital N, of course, uh, that's a, 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 a strong suggestion about how rare they are, which would suggest also that they might be hard to find. There, it's going to be a very specific, it might be a very specific family that we find eventually. Uh, uh, Joseph Beck in 1991 found that he could do that, a trigonometric polynomial with complex unimodular coefficients in a, in a lanulus, uh, but the complex coefficients are roots of unity, so they're discrete. It's not continuous, continuously distributed on the unit circle. They're roots of unity of order 400. And he thinks that if you worked on the method, you could bring that 400 down and down and possibly even get to three. That would be the limit of the method. But of course, we're interested in square roots of unity. And uh, that he, he, though he says the method breaks down you know, between three and two. Uh, the third major event in the, in the history of the subject um, is uh, the result of Jean-Pierre Cahan in 1980, uh, in which he constructed uh, trigonometric polynomials of the, of the wider class with um, complex unimodular coefficients that are, unimod that are uniformly within 1 minus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon, times squared of n, and he called these ultra-flat polynomials. Uh, his epsilons have been whipped to zero <coughs> fairly quickly, uh, and then more recently, Blombier and Bourguin um, had, uh, get construction, which they tend to zero even more quickly. Now, the, the history I've described is the history as the pure mathematics community knew it up until about 1995. What we didn't realize was that the people working on signal processing were doing some of the same things. Um, people, Barker, Turin, Golay, and so on. And so, uh, Marcel Golay uh, studied what we call uh, little bit polynomials. And he would take the mean square and uh, expand the non-diagonal terms in a, in a sum of cosines. Uh, these coefficients, v sub k, are called the aperiodic autocorrelation coefficients. And um, Dole, in 1949, um, defined what would be a complementary pair of Littlewood polynomials, f1 and f2, in which the aperiodic uh, correlation coefficients of the of f sub one were exactly the negatives of the coefficients of f sub two. So that when you add them together, all those non-diagonal things cancel out, and you just get a constant. And of course, that's what Shapiro had done. And and Golay also knew that if you have a complementary pair, you can make a length n. You can make a new complementary pair of length two n by using the law of the trapezoid of the parallelogram. So. 
he had what um, Shapiro had done in the, in, in the, at least the basic result, and he also found complementary pairs of length 10, and he was interested in uh, what lengths they exist, you know, for what lengths do they exist, the complementary pairs. Uh, he was also interested in how small you, how, how, um, how small you could make the, uh, the, the autocorrelation coefficients and, and the mean square of the autocorrelation coefficients is a, is a uh, natural thing to consider because if you, if you apply Parcival's identity to this, uh, or you subtract n from both sides here and then square and integrate, uh, you get this identity, uh, basically Parcival's identity again. And that's measuring how tightly bunched the mean square of f is to its mean. Uh, and uh, he was, he wrote a number of papers, half a dozen or more, over a period of years. And finally, in 1972, he defined, to, to measure how well one was doing, he defined what he called the merit factor, which is n squared divided by the sum. And of course, you want the sum to be small compared with n squared, and so you want the merit factor to be large. And in Little, Littlewood's, if you cast Littlewood's conjecture in the language of merit factors, Littlewood is saying the merit factor can be arbitrarily large. So I thought that the merit factor, the best merit factors would be 12 point something, and he had some reason for believing that. Uh, today, uh, well, the Littlewood's calculation of the fourth power of, the fourth moment of, of the uh, Shapiro polynomials shows that they have merit factor of three. Um, in 1988, um, two guys proved that, uh, generated a family of Eric of Littlewood polynomials with uh, merit factor tending to six. And, and they used uh, the Legendre symbol for coefficients, but not in their natural order. They, it was a cyclic shift. You shift them along uh, a, qu a quarter of the period. They found that a quarter of the period shift was the optimal and that gives a merit factor of six. Um, Burns and Newman show that if you have random coefficients, plus or minus one random coefficients, then on average, the, one over the merit factor is one minus one over n. So, so the merit factor gets as small as one and as large as one. Um, and recently, more recently, the uh, infinite family of Littlewood polynomials has been exhibited with merit factor uh, bigger than six. These authors, the, the, the point of their paper mainly was to show that it's not six. The answer, that they didn't, the authors before conjectured that six is the best, is the, is the asymptotic best, and they didn't believe that, and so they wanted to prove that, that, that their belief was correct. In the meantime, uh, Barker, uh, um, was interested in the, in the very smallest possible autocorrelation co uh, coefficient. They, if you remember the, the formula for B sub K, it's, it's a sum of n minus K numbers that are plus or minus one. And so, uh, so it's an integer, and it's odd if n minus K is odd, and it's even if n minus K is even. So uh, if Barker says, OK, if it's going to be an even number, I want it to be 0. And if it's an odd number, I want it to be plus or minus 1, which means as, poss as small as possible in both cases. And these are the known Barker codes, and it's conjectured. Well, apart from, well, there's some. Each Barker code that I have listed there, there's three others that come in families, because you can multiply everything by minus one, or you can introduce an alternation of sign, and that doesn't, so uh, they all have the same characteristics. So you get three for one, you get four for one. And so these are representatives of each of the known ones, and um, it's now believed that there aren't any more. Um, the ones of length 11 and 13 are used in, in radar and so on, uh, and it would be handy if there was one of length 25 or 50 or something, but uh, it's now known, uh, Michael, where are you? Um, you know, they've now gotten past 10 to the 51. But there's no Barker code you had before, at most one, up to four times 10 to the 33, and now you know that there are none less than 10 to the 51, is that right? 
uh, almost there's there's uh, there's none below that. There was one example known there. Um, the next example I know of has 51 digits. There could be something else that sneaks in, for all I know. Okay. But I know there's none below that. Okay. So this is now. There are none. More, there are no. There are no more parked codes up to this time. Yeah. Uh, in the re remaining time, I'd like to just uh, say a few words about Shapiro polynomials, which I'm very interested in. Uh, recall that they look like this, and uh, the characteristic property is that they're bounded by their root mean square. Uh, but Shapiro considered not just uh, the partial sum truncated at powers of two, but of the more general, oh, I, what I wanted to say is that um, several papers have been written um, about the Shapiro polynomials, uh, uh, notably with John Brillhart. Uh, John Brillhart took a big interest in this. Uh, uh, he wrote with Carlitz, he wrote by himself, he wrote with Lamont and, and Morton, um, again with Morton, and then with Ergish and Morton, and uh, a final paper with Morton, sort of summarizing everything. Um, he, these papers contribute a lot to what we know about the Shapiro polynomials. Um, and Shapiro himself considered arbitrary partial sums and showed that they are also big O squared of n. And he had a coefficient uh, of a constant 2 plus the uh, square root of 8, uh, which was later reduced by Michel Mendes Faust and Gerald Tenenbaum to 2 plus square root of 2. And after that, uh, Babar Safari uh, multiplied that bound by square root of 3 over 5, which is, I think, where it stands now, although square root of 6 is the conjectured best constant, so we're getting close to the square root of 6. Babar says he has a proof, and he promises to win it up. <laughs> over lunch, Sound was recalling that when he was an undergraduate, Babar came through Ann Arbor and was talking about square root of 6 then, and that was a while ago, so done. Um, we're, uh, I hope that now when he has enough pressure on him that he'll actually do it, but uh, it's been a long time coming. Another thing that, uh, if you remember one thing from my talk, I hope it would be this, is that um, the same inequality applies, uh, perhaps with a different constant, but to uh, subsums, not just to uh, initial partial sum, but you take a block in any position, any length, is square root of h. Of course, you can imagine how this could be useful in harmonic analysis also. It's not just you don't want to sum by parts, but, but you, want to, uh, you want it to cancel down to square root of the number of terms. It can't cancel better than that for all x because Parseval's identity still applies. Its root mean square is still root h. Uh, but, um, the, and, and uh, this is notable because the hardy little bit example that I showed initially and, and the Biosum example, they don't have this property of canceling down to the square of the, of the term, number of terms in short intervals. And so this is not just um, interesting because it achieves with plus or minus one coefficients what hardy little bit did with complex unimodular coefficients, but it actually does something that their example doesn't do. And, um, I proved this a number of years ago and then only recently discovered I was working out what, what constant I could get. And then looking through the literature, I found that, in fact, Gaon and Salem had this more than 15 years ago. <laughs> so a really long time ago. It's, it's unfortunate that it was uh, sort of hidden because it's in chapter 10 of a rather esoteric book they wrote. And if, you were, if you're not really into the area and reading every page, uh, you wouldn't know that. And, and they needed this property for the construction that they were giving for a, for a function with a certain property. They had constant 16. I can get constant 2 squared plus square root of 8, which actually was a constant that occurred earlier. Um, but um, and I think other people have observed have gotten this constant also. Uh, I, I ran some computations. Uh, which led me to conjecture that the best constant is 3. Certainly, I can see that it's not better than I, I can see a sequence of, of m's and h's uh, where the sum is approaching 3 times square root of h. So 3 would be best possible. And I've been 
um, I computed this quantity. Now, this, this is a rather trick, uh, ambitious undertaking because potentially, well, there's, of course, there are infinitely many values of x, but also potentially there are infinitely many values of m. But I was able to show that any block of coefficients, plus or minus one coefficients that you'll ever see in the Shapiro sequence, will occur uh, with, uh, within that range of values of m. And so you have, that's a, makes it a finite search. And for as far as x is concerned, I just do a equal, equally spaced points on a rather fine mesh. And that then guarantees that the answer is correct within some maybe 1% of the root mean square or something like that. Uh, I wondered how many different blocks might occur because uh, obviously if you can, uh, have a short list, it's less computation to do. Uh, if you let B of H be the number of blocks uh, patterns of plus or minus one of length H that you see among the Shapiro coefficients, uh, well, we're getting two to the K here. Uh, in the first four cases. This can't continue because, um, well, first of all, Salem and Zygmunt showed that if you have random plus or minus ones, independent random coefficients, then the, uh, the, root mean, the, the maximum of the modulus is comparable to square root of n log n, uh, almost surely, here almost surely means uh, with probability tending to one as n goes to infinity. So, uh, we know that the Shapiro polynomials are a big O of square root of n, which means they are uh, not typical in that regard, so their number will be small compared to 2 to the n. Uh, secondly, we can see that it has to stop at this point. In other words, b of 5 will be less than 32, because if n is congruent to 2 mod 4, then c of n plus 1 is the negative of c of n. And that means you can't have five ones in a row. Uh, five one, five consecutive integers will contain uh, include dumping. Um, in fact, these are the values um, five through eight. And then at eight, uh, you note that eight is, uh, the value of eight is uh, seven times eight. And that seems to continue, that it's uh, eight times h minus one. And then on, right? As far as I calculated, I got tired of calculating that for a while. But uh, and I think I sort of see why that's true. But uh, anyway, I conjecture that that's the number of blocks. Of course, if you're going to use this computationally, you have to know what the blocks are, too. It's not just knowing how many there are. You have to be able to generate them in some efficient way. So here's a, a bit. I have some programs, and they've been spitting out tables of numbers. and. Uh, Typical um, array. Um, the the value that we care about is, is you know the question is how big is mu of h and we see a, a fairly big value there at four and then we see an even bigger value at sixteen and we notice that well sixteen is four squared what about four cubed well. 2.75. Well, isn't that interesting? And sure enough, at 2.56, it's 2.875. Each one is twice is half the distance below three. At powers of four. And it's always occurring uh, with uh, x equals zero, which means you're just summing the coefficients. There's no exponential involved. Uh, these numbers, 107 and Twenty-seven there and seven. Those are known from the study that that Brillhart and Morton did of the of the sums of the uh, Shapiro coefficients. That I mean, it's not an accident that four times seven minus one is twenty-seven, and that four times seven minus one is one of seven. And then, uh, you know, it goes. It's a sequence like that. And, and the length of the sum you form is four to the k in the k one. So and those tend to three, of course, and so that shows that the and, and I I wasn't trying to make it three. I had no conjecture. I just I did the I did the or wrote the program to get some to try to see what the numbers would suggest might be the best confidence. And I you know they suggested to me three, and I can see that three 
would be best possible. Um, there are other conjectures on the Shapiro polynomials. In 2006, I visited Paris, and Safari told me that he conjectured that um, p sub k mod squared divided by 2 to the k plus 1 is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. I, 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 he didn't offer any justification for this. He just said he conjectured it. No, no, no reason. Not. And uh, I got back to Ann Arbor and I wrote a program, and uh, it, 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 it looked plausible. And then I, I, I had the idea, well, if they're in that interval, well, maybe they're uniformly distributed in the, in the disk, in the complex plane. And so then, oh, we might as well look at some cute numbers. Uh, now that starts to look like it's a little thin in the middle and thick on the outside, but um, when the curve is moving quickly, it still leaves just as much ink on the paper. And if it's moving faster on the outer boundary, then it's not doesn't mean that it's really there more of the time. Um, and you can we uh, uh, can do you can plot the polynomial against its derivative, and you sort of see that. When one is increasing, the other one has to be increasing also. So uh, the way to test whether what the real distribution is, is to do a scatter plot, but not a continuous curve. So there's P8 at 5,000 points, P9 at 10,000 points, the 7,000 points, and then P10 at 10,000 points. I, mean, that, I find this reasonably uh, encouraging for the idea that this is tending toward uniform distribution. There was something else I was going to say. Let's skip that. Um, just thank you. Any questions? They put me at the end of the day so that if I ran over, I wouldn't be postponing anyone else's oh, talk. <laughs> Rohart and Morrison do on the Rudin Shapiro polynomials? Uh, uh, well, that Rohart would, and Morton, they did, you mentioned them. Yeah, Pat Morton, yeah, it was the two of them, Don Lewis. He, uh, the two of them, well, it's, uh, it would take a, a week to summarize. But okay. They did a lot. They figured out stuff about the coefficients, they figured out stuff about where the zeros are. Um, they have all kinds of identities on what group. Various polynomials. Are you conjectures to the general and the diamond H important for signal processing applications? I don't know. I, I don't know whether that group of people are aware of the Gan Salem estimate. I mean, I don't think even many harmonic analysts know about it. They're the people. I mean, that's the thing, if you remember anything from the talk, remember that estimate, that it's still square root of n, the square root of h in size, even in short blocks. That's, that should be better known. Go ahead. Could, um, can, I, can I ask two things simultaneously? <laughs> One, could you, would, you, would you be too much trouble to flip back to that chart you showed where you had all the pluses and minuses? Sorry, say again? The, the chart with all of the pluses and minuses that you showed towards the end, maybe it was about six slides back. Would it be possible to, would it be too much trouble to pull it up one more time to let us look at it? No. Well, maybe it was more than six slides. <laughs> <laughs> that, nope, nope. Uh, no, no, keep going. Sorry, thank you, though. I like that one, though. That's cool. Oh, you want the marker? Right? Okay, it was like 25 slides back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a graduate student. I can't count yet. That one. Okay. So is there any... Is, is The pattern is horizontal, right? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, there, is, there, is there any diagonal pattern going on? Like, as, like for instance, like the, the diagonals on which they're all pluses look like maybe they... I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just... I'm just uh, well, since the sequence seems to end here, you can That's the end of the sequence. That's the end. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, I didn't realize that. I was like, I was like extrapolating. Like, wow, what could it be? You, you can formulate something, but then Richard Guy would call that the strong law of small numbers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Any other? Uh... 
Well, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.